Hello and welcome to Sunday Politics in Northern Ireland. It's all change on the hill as MLAs vote to cut their numbers, reform their departments and perhaps establish an official opposition. So will it create a new super-efficient Stormont or will we scarcely notice the difference? We hear from the independent MLA who's behind the push for change and from Alliance and the SDLP. Plus, there's still no official date for polling day, but election fever is catching in the Republic. We have a special report from Donegal. Oh, far too many wrong people got in last time and made a bad job of this county in Donegal and Ireland, all over the place. Well, things are on the up, so I think people are a little bit more uh, positive about everything. And... and with their thoughts on that and more, my guests of the day are Felicity Houston and Chris Donnelly. <laughs> Not fit for purpose and in urgent need of reform. Just some of the criticisms that politicians themselves have directed at the current Stormont system. But is it all about to change? MLAs have been busying themselves with a number of bills which will reduce the number of Assembly members, merge executive departments and establish a formal opposition. So will it be enough to improve Stormont's image and create a more efficient system? With me are the independent unionist MLA John McAllister, and councillors Nicola Mallon from the SDLP and Nula McAllister from the Alliance Party. You're all welcome to the programme. John McAllister, first of all, um, your private member's bill has its uh, consideration stage on Tuesday up at Stormont. Um, do you think it will ultimately see the establishment of an effective opposition at Stormont? Well, I, I certainly hope so. And I think that broad package that you mentioned at the start of the programme of changing, of reducing departments uh, and ultimately the reduction in the MLAs, albeit not to 2021, and the opposition, bell my bell. All of that is about how do you start to create this idea of a collective government uh, with a, a, an agreed programme for government, moving in the one direction and held to account by a robust opposition that ultimately gives voters choice and the ability of choice and change at a future election. There are an awful lot of uh, amendments from the other parties and Sinn Féin is opposing every clause of the bill at this stage. Well, Sinn Féin, uh, right back from November, uh, meeting had told me they were likely to oppose, to oppose every clause, mainly on the grounds of that they'd agreed fresh start. And they were certainly pushing the idea that my bill had, had influenced fresh start as it had improved the provision for opposition from, uh, from the, the old Stormont House agreement until the fresh start document came out. But, I mean, the, the, it's there and it's being debated. All of the parties, and I say this including Sinn Féin, all of the parties have engaged with me on, on the bill and that's been very, very useful. Well, uh, Nicola Mallon, Sinn Féin is opposed, as I say, to Mr McAllister's bill. Will the SDLP vote with Republicans to kill it on Tuesday? No, uh, we won't. The SDLP has worked quite closely with John and John has to be commended for bringing this bill forward. If you were to look at the glaring weaknesses in the system, it is the, the lack of an official opposition. Uh, it is around the misuse of the petition of concern and also a lack of openness, transparency and accountability with the budget process in particular. John's bill with the SDLP's amendments, I think, makes good inroads in trying to address that. Mm. Um, you're not happy with the notion of petition of, of, of concern. What changes do you think need to happen as far as that's concerned? Well, we think that the petition of concern has morphed quite considerably from what it was intended to be. And we have tabled an amendment. Um, essentially, if someone tables a petition of concern, an ad hoc committee will immediately scrutinise that to see if it has any adverse impact on human rights and equality. If it doesn't, it proceeds through the assembly process. But if it does, then the petition of concern would stand. OK, so you want it to change. You think it's been abused, but you don't want to get rid of it altogether? No, because unfortunately we believe that we're not in a place where there won't be a, a, a misuse of power, uh, where there won't be um, domination and sectarianism. So unfortunately we have to maintain the safeguards for minority rights and we believe that by doing this we're doing it in the right way, the right spirit and in an effective way too. And can I just, before I move on to the Alliance position on this, as far as opposition is concerned, I mean your current party leader, before he was party leader, said there is no place called opposition, but he made a speech at the end of last week in which he seemed to say suggest that opposition might be a good idea. Is that suggesting that the SDLP is moving in that direction after May's election? No, I think Colin was very clear in saying that we believe that after this mandate there should be an effective official opposition. But make no mistake, we're fighting this election to be in government. Um, Nuno McAllister, what's your understanding of Alliance's position, first of all, on John McAllister's bill? 
Well, Alliance, through my colleague Trevor Lunn in the Assembly, we've been quite constructive working alongside John and we will be supportive of the bill once it comes to the Assembly floor. And I think one of the highlights of the bill is this reform of the Petition of Concern. And my party would have major concerns of the abuse of the Petition of Concern. I, would don't, I don't think and I would not like to see that mechanism being used to actually slap down the bill. It would be a great embarrassment for the parties who do use it and my hope is that a petition of concern is not used because something that creates more accountability, more scrutiny is a good thing for the public. And is it the case, is it a possibility that the Alliance Party might opt, could opt if, if John McAllister's bill is successful, to take an opposition stance in the next mandate rather than seek to be in the executive as you currently are? Well, Mark, no party fights an election to go into opposition. Parties fight an election to go into government and to govern for the best of the people. And whenever that happens, after the May's election, then Alliance will see where our position is then. Um, but you do support the notion of an effective opposition, even if you might opt or hope that you're not in it yourselves? Oh, yes, of course. As I, as I said, something that actually creates more accountability to hold politicians to account when they're making decisions in the executive is not, uh, nothing but a good thing. Of course, the, the other uh, piece of legislation that I uh, mm -hmm. talked about in the introduction, the, the Reduction of Numbers Bill, your party's tabled an amendment um, wanting the reduction in numbers to come into effect for this year's uh, election rather than 2021, um, but there's not really any real prospect of that happening. You accept that? Well, we're in a really bizarre situation here. OK, so politicians have agreed to reduce the numbers from six to five per constituencies, but they've agreed to hold off until 2021 or the next assembly election. But yet on Monday, we're pushing through final stage of the department's bill, which reduces the number of departments. So a decision which affects the politicians, something that could save the public £11 million in five years. We're talking about 90 new police officers, 90 new nurses. That's something that I think that the public would like. We need to ensure that the MLAs are held accountable on this. Um, John McAllister, is that the kind of issue that leads members of the public watching the comings and goings at Stormont to reach the conclusion that, frankly, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing? I think it's, it's an open debate and the alliance policy on this has been quite long standing. The agreement and all the other parties uh, have agreed and then fresh start to do it in 2021. Um, I would have much preferred to see us um, not debating this until a new assembly mandate when you time to work out is 90 the right number because we've also the, the part of changes at Westminster might also affect the ultimate numbers. And that's not just self-interest, is it? Because with the greatest respect, independents mm -hmm. like yourself are, are very often the individuals and smaller parties tend mm -hmm. to be uh, picking up the mm -hmm. sixth seats. Yeah. So, you know, if it goes from six seats to five, someone like yourself could, could struggle to be returned. Uh, absolutely. And, and that good and important of having independent voices in there, I think, is, is important. But also, we are still grappling and... and Right throughout the, the committee stage of my bill, it's always debating this idea of how do we continue to address our historic problems um, and once you reduce and change the size of constituencies, you do, you can um, change the makeup of those constituencies or indeed reduce somewhat the, the spread of, of candidates across them. For example, you might have more constituencies with no nationalist representatives or more with no unionist representatives. And we have to ask ourselves, is that a good thing? Are we ready for that? And that's why I think most of the parties are re reluctant to go too fast, too soon on mm. this issue in the departments. You're, you're uh, nodding, uh, Nicola yeah, Mallon. I mean, this is an issue that your party touched on. Yes, um, we agree that in the reduction of numbers, but I think we need to be careful here because we're changing the structure of government we're, in terms of departments. We're amalgamating departments. We're looking to set up an official opposition. We have the change in the number of constituencies. We've changed from Westminster. So I think that we need to be cautious. We need change, absolutely, but we don't want to rush it too far that we end up causing damage. D you looked as if you were shaking your head, uh, Nuna McCaster. Do, do you not agree with the point made by your uh, two fellow panellists? Well, I don't here because the change that we're actually, some of us are opposing is the change that affects the politicians. It's the change in the reducing of the numbers. I mean, yes, John mentioned that the Westminster boundaries might change, but who's to say that's to stop a further change? We currently have the power to reduce it. Why power and then wait five years to do something. It sounds like a bit of self-interest from a lot of parties and it's something that I think that a lot of people can get on board with. 
We are talking about ensuring that there is better inclusion because contrary to what John actually said, there are members of other parties who have just one MLA and they support us on this issue because they know that we can ensure better accountability, that can we, we can work alongside the reduction in the departments and the number of people on committees and we can ensure that we provide better value for money at Stormont. I mean, forgive me for saying, uh, it will work quite well this tactic um, for the Alliance on the doorsteps potentially. Some might think that you are being a little bit cynical here because you can actually say to people who are potential voters, look we think this should change um, and you can nail your colours to the mast but you know it is not going to change and disadvantage you. So because you think something is not going to change you should not do it? No, but this is something, but it that, happen, this is something that Alliance have called for for a number of years and just because we think that it might not pass does not mean we do not have to move through with it. There are parties that do this all the time and we are a that people get on board with us. We're not talking about something that will create a massive change. You can still feel the number of candidates as you wish in each constituency. That will not stop it. But what we're talking about is on election day, right. it will be five, not six MLAs. John McAllister, just a final thought to you. Your, your bill uh, has its consideration stage on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. It may go through, but do you accept if it goes through, it's going to be a hugely changed version of what you well, initially I authored? Mean, I, I would suspect, you know, I, I can't entirely predict what's going to come out the other end. I mean, I, I did, when I drafted the bill and, and worked on the bill, we did set up, I, I think even as, as you agreed at the time of second stage, was a pretty ambitious programme of reform of both the assembly getting an official opposition of the way the executive work collective responsibility all of those things um, were very ambitious but even I don't get all of what I would like uh, in the bill which I accept it has certainly fired up a conversation with parties with academics and commentators and saying this is the sort of change we might need over a period of time and I'm going to continue the campaign for that that change. All right. Um, thanks very much indeed. Stay with us just to hear what our uh, guests of the day have to say. But thank you very much indeed for now. Let's hear from uh, Chris Donnelly and uh, Felicity Houston, who are, are with me. Um, welcome to you both. Um, Chris, Sinn Féin spokesperson said to us this morning, um, the bill, this is uh, uh, John McAllister's bill, is unnecessary because the Fresh Start Agreement has provision for an opposition in line with the Good Friday Agreement. So th that's an explanation for why Republicans have opposed each and every one of the 24 clauses in the bill. Um, what do you think is going to happen come Tuesday? Well, I think it's, first of all, I think John's to be commended for ensuring that the issue of institutional reform at Stormont is kept through the private members' bill on the agenda. I mean, we do know, because we have a coalition of the unwilling, the five parties and an executive, which is necessary through the haunt, through the legacy of the conflict, but we know that the product of that, the consequence has meant that we have no unifying, discernible governing agenda at Stormont at the, through the executive. And that's led to a situation now where departments uh, run by different parties have their own agenda and that leads to protracted deadlock at the executive table, which goes on for years over issues of education, health, local government reform. But I think crucially, and this is, and this is why I think that Sinn Féin can be quite relaxed about this, that system benefits Sinn Féin and the DUP as the lead parties within unionism and nationalism. And therefore, it's going to have to be driven, not by Sinn Féin, it'll be driven by the SDLP and Ulster Unionists because it is in their interests uh, to be able to move off of the executive uh, to, to ensure that they can be more... Okay. Uh, <coughs> sorry, sorry, go ahead. OK, no, I just wanted to bring Felicity in on the overall issue of, uh, of reform. There are, uh, there's a package, if you like, uh, of measures coming forward here. Do they broadly make sense in your view? Well, they do, yes. I mean, our current political structure is sort of one of Dante's circles of hell for most politicians, isn't it? I mean, if you actually want to change anything as a politician, you can't implement a policy because you're stuck in this horrendous co uh, coalition you're forced together. So anything that starts to break break that up and turn us into a normal political state, a uh, functioning state with opposition policies implemented and people electing politicians on the basis of the policies they will bring forward has to be welcomed and I think we'd be delighted. OK, um, we'll talk to you a bit later in the programme for now. Thanks both very much indeed. Now they haven't called it officially yet, but the Irish election will take place in the coming weeks. The poll presents big questions. Will Enda Kenny be returned as Taoiseach? Will there be a shift to Micheál Martin's Fianna of Fall? And what about Sinn Féin? Can the party make the gains that put it into government in the Dáil? One area being targeted by Sinn Féin is Donegal, where the party currently holds two seats but hopes to gain a third. Our political correspondent Stephen Walker has been to the county to gauge opinion. Over 200 kilometres from Dublin, some regard this as a place apart. 
Elections here are also different, and even before a vote has been cast, headlines have been created. It's a case of old change here in Donegal. Once there were two constituencies, they've now been merged to create one. Once six TDs were elected, this time it'll be five. It makes this election race very tight and the final outcome difficult to predict. Sinn Féin have two TDs here at the moment, Padraig McLaughlin and Pierce Doherty, and they hope local councillor Gary Doherty can win a third seat. But vote management will be key. It's a risky strategy. It's very ambitious to take three out of five uh, seats for Sinn Féin in the county. Um, but it's one that me and Padraig are, have been the instigators of because we believe that it's uh, important if we're in a position to lead the next government, and then Donegal needs to play its part. You say it's risky. Why do you say it's risky? Because when you stand three candidates and you're looking to manage the vote, it puts the other sitting TDs uh, in jeopardy. Reporter Kieran O'Donnell says Sinn Féin are in a strong position and could take a third seat in Donegal. Anything is possible on this election. Um, they're guaranteed two seats. Um, whether Gary Doherty makes enough uh, impact to stay in the race remains to be seen. Um, it's unlikely but not impossible. Fine Gael are running sitting TD Joe McHugh and they've also selected a fresh face with a well-known name. Is this our 20 what? How long are we doing this? It's a long time, mate. It's a long time. Paddy Hart's father was a Fine Gael TD. He says Donegal needs to be better connected and that includes improving the A5 in Northern Ireland. The last major city on the island has not got a motorway, which is Derry. And Derry City is essentially our capital if, the, if there wasn't a border. So, uh, so it's, it's really important that for the economy of the, of the island uh, that the A5 gives that, that connection. Uh, okay. Hi, how are you keeping? Good to Fianna see you. Foyle want oh, two uh, seats in Donegal. TD Charlie McConnell Oag is running with former MEP Pat the Cope Gallagher. Post election, Fianna Foyle have made it clear who they will go into coalition with. We will not be going into government with Fine Gael or Sinn Féin. Our objective is to become the largest party and to bring about a fair recovery, one that actually will ensure that Donegal here can benefit from the recovery that is now starting in the urban areas and indeed that, we, that, that brings about a fairer approach to governing the country over the next five years. Voters in Donegal will have a number of independent candidates to choose from. In other constituencies, independents find it hard to get elected because they're up against a party machine. But in Donegal, there's an independent tradition. Thomas Pringle became an independent TD in 2011. If he is returned, he's prepared to talk to other parties. I would have a, the, a shoppingness, I suppose you would call it, of things that Donegal requires, but also things that I would like to see happen on, on a national level. And if the party, whether it's Fianna Fáil or Fine Gael, want to do business with me based on that and based on those demands, um, I'll talk to them definitely, but it, my support for anybody wouldn't be guaranteed. So far, there are three other independent candidates in this race, Neve Kennedy, Desi Shields and Tim Jackson. And there's a Green Party candidate, Paula Flanagan, it means Donegal voters have plenty of choice. It's a massive election for sure. Um, I think that the left will do well this time. I just don't like any of them, you know, because I think they're just squeezing us dry. So. Oh, far too many wrong people got in last time and made a bad job of this county and Donegal and Ireland all over the place. Well, things are on the up, so I think people are a little bit more uh, positive about everything and the current government, I think, are doing a good job. The boundary changes and the number of candidates makes it difficult to predict how all the seats will fall. There, there are so many ponderables at the minute and the fact that there's going to be, the, the, the field is going to be so wide and varied. It will go down to the wire, um, there will be a lot of counts and there will be, be a lot of counts and a lot of certain votes before the last two candidates are elected in Donegal. The boundaries may have changed here and it may look different. But when the election is finally called, the fight for seats in Donegal will be as competitive as ever.
Stephen Walker reporting from Donegal. And two more independent candidates mm. have now entered the fray, Frank McBrearty and Ian McGarvey. Let's hear more from Chris Donnelly and Felicity Houston. Chris, is the battle for seats in Donegal likely to be a microcosm of the broader general election campaign, do you think? I don't think so necessarily. I mean, Donegal is unique. It's an area where perhaps uh, Sinn Féin are particularly strong. One of the themes from Republicans uh, along the border, where they're strong, they're getting stronger. Dublin as well. But I think the story of this election, and it should be announced on Tuesday, it's only going to have a three and a half week long campaign. Fine Gael, Zenda Kenny will be the first uh, Fine Gael Taoiseach to gain re-election, which is a piece of history in itself. It's, the story will be, will there be enough Labour TDs to ensure that it's a stable coalition, or will they need a third party or independence to prop it up? And those are all the, the fascinating what-ifs. And as, as Chris says, Felicity, a really short, sharp campaign. Absolutely, and more of it, please. I think everybody should have three weeks as an election campaign. Well, that's the way you like it, is it? Oh, absolutely, there's a limit. Even for a political anorak like me, three and a half weeks would be plenty, thanks. Yeah, uh, some people are uh, real political anoraks are saying, Chris, um, we might have a second election to sort this out, of course. I well, think some people are actually um, praying for that. Well, the way it looks at the moment, uh, Labour are only sitting on 9 10%. That won't be enough. So it could be the case that, as happened in the early 80s, there had to be a second election mm. a few months later. Well, we'll see. That'll make some people happy and some people not at all happy. Um, we'll speak to you at the very end. Thanks very much. Uh, let's just pause and take a look back at the week in 60 seconds with Chris Page. In or out? In London, the Taoiseach made clear his hopes in the Brexit debate. I want Britain to remain a central member of the European Union uh, because from our island point of view, this is a really critical issue. But back in Belfast, the First Minister suggested Mr Kenny should keep his hopes to himself. He's entitled to an opinion, he's entitled to a view, but at the end of the day it's a matter for the people of the United Kingdom. With the Assembly election coming up, a veteran decided to buy out. After 18 years, and there have been some of them very tough years as we went along, off with the old, on with the new. Or not so new, as a familiar face re-entered the political arena. I'm not somebody who could simply go off, have a nice life, because I would find myself shouting at the television and getting frustrated at politics. But what were the chances of all parties agreeing to do away with election posters? Do you want me to be very honest? Of course I do. I, I think the chances of that happening are due. And a warning for all politicians, someone is always listening. Call Mr Jim Mollister. I'm sure why. <laughs> Chris Page reporting, just time for a quick look ahead with uh, Felicity and Chris. Um, Felicity, Naomi Long's return certainly has been, uh, has been made pretty clear. She wants to come back to the Assembly. Yeah, well, she was my MP in East Belfast, and I think one of the things Naomi's great at is covering a lot of issues. She's very strong in animal welfare, and that's a massive issue in Northern Ireland now. So if she gets back into the Assembly, I think she'd be a real plus for that. Mm. I think she'll give David Ford something to keep him up and, and make sure his performance is what it needs to be, because that's an obvious tools. new leader. Yes. Chris? I think she's a formidable politician and also has tremendous electoral appeal. I mean, in East Belfast, it took a United Unity candidate to actually defeat her. So it would be interesting to see how Alliance perform with her on the ticket in East Belfast this time around. OK. And uh, Arlene Foster has said Terry Wogan was a legend of broadcasting. Well, yeah, I mean, he's, he's part of my life. You know, I've been, he's been around for so long, absolutely, for us all. A lot all. of people feel like that. Thanks both very much indeed. That is it from all of us. Back to Andrew in London. Bye-bye.